This video is about a struggle, a struggle for self-autonomy and integration. We intend to argue the case through the experiences and opinions of physically disabled people for the provision of real alternatives to segregated residential institutions, alternatives that incorporate all the necessary features and assistance for secure, integrated and independent living. Many factors interact to make this possible, but as we shall see, the three main elements are well-designed and located housing, appropriate aids and equipment, and a flexible, secure system of personal help. Easy as it is to pinpoint what is needed, what is desirable, what the alternatives to residential institutions are, in practice it has been difficult, a struggle in fact against medical myths vested interests and a range of barriers and constraints to obtaining housing and the necessary human support. In the words of Ken Davis, a participant in this program. There was a time when I thought we were crazy because it, all, it, it only seemed to me that there were two things involved. All we needed was a roof over our head and some help. Mm. You know, and I thought, well, there must be something wrong with us. You know, we've got it wrong somehow. <laughs> because everybody's going into these, you know, huge expositions, you know, about institutional versus community, you know, and all of this. And I was thinking, well, that can't be. You know, what's so complicated about having a house to live in and help to go with it? To gain a better understanding of the difficulties physically disabled people encounter in establishing a system of independent living, we must first examine our society's response to physical impairment from the moment the condition becomes a problem. This usually occurs within the home environment, so it is here that our analysis begins. Doreen Tunstall is facing the problem of recent physical impairment. She is still living at home, and her husband and two daughters are trying to cope. So at the moment you, you aren't able to do any cooking yourself? No, because I mean it's uh, the house is built for an able-bodied person. It's not built for a person in a wheelchair to work from, because the surfaces are such you know they've got to be a certain height, as you will know. What what what, what has this situation meant to you, Harry? Well, it means that uh, initially I've had to. Um, that's the time off work. I've already been off three weeks now and uh, I saw a doctor yesterday, our own doc GP, and he advised again that I should be off for at least four weeks to look after Doreen because she's unable to look after herself being immobile. And this means, of course, now, um, fortunately my firm have allowed me to take time off with pay and I appreciate this won't uh, go on indefinitely until there comes such a time to say, well, You'll either have to return to work if you can't find someone to look after your wife, or failing that, it may mean you'll have to give up your job. So what we're looking for is immediate help, which we want. Uh, we could have done it actually when Donny came out of hospital three weeks ago. Yeah. Unfortunately, this doesn't, isn't always the case. We find that if you want immediate help, when in a case like this where a person does come out of hospital when they need them right away, you can't get them. It takes three or four weeks. There's a lot of arbitrary going on uh, at this time. You can't get people to sort of make a decision at all. And uh, you've got to uh, try and improvise yourself. Uh, in a house like this, which is not adapted for a person who's disabled, there's a lot of things you've got to do, like um, make adaptations or find out from people how you can get adaptations. Uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, we are starting from scratch. So we have to find out from other people who are in a similar situation how they cope with this and try going along with ourselves and see if we, we can improvise in any way. Moira Stocks is currently living in a local authority hostel where she has spent the last eight years. Moira, could you tell us something about your situation before you went into the local authority hostel? I live with my sister. And it was very satisfactory. We had, I had two rooms, a bedroom and a sitting room. And I could walk upstairs and get into the bath myself. And I was quite independent. I used to do my own shopping and uh, prepare tea for them when they were at work, peel potatoes, do my own washing, marvellous. And then I got flu. 
I was so badly afflicted that I lost the use of my legs. So there was a mad panic where to go. And we inquired about nursing homes, and there were a hundred and something a week then, in 1974, beyond my means, because I haven't got a pension. So my daughter said all he had, had to offer was a geriatric ward. Winifred is presently living in the Leonard Cheshire home in Rochdale. I felt rather bitter that I had to leave my own home. I'd lived disabled about five years on my own. And I was sort of uh, influenced by various people. I was pressed, and I must admit, not by the social work. He was the best of the lot. And uh, he did his best to keep me there. But all, everybody else thought, oh, you know, you ought to get out of that house. And it was a consult to the family who I had to be, I had to go in the end. And I was completely unaware of any other options. There was no way that anybody was going to uh, redact my house because of finances. And I was offered no other option at all. Ken and Maggie Davis now live in Grove Road a cooperative scheme in which the physically disabled tenants occupy three ground floor flats specially adapted for them and in conjunction with three first floor flats for able-bodied supporting families. Achieving independent living was a struggle. They recall their early experiences when they were still living with their families. Ken, can I ask you what, what and Maggie, what situation were you in before you actually moved into Grove Road? It was, uh, it was classic, really. I was living with my elderly mother and brother. I met Maggie, who was living in an institution at uh, Stoke Mandeville Hospital. There was an institution uh, situated in the grounds of the hospital. And uh, we met uh, when I was down there for a checkup. Uh, and really, that's where the whole thing started. As the problem for Meg was the uh, problem with your mother, wasn't it, Meg, really? Your, your home situation was a bit different from, from mine. Yes. Um, after I had the accident, um, I couldn't go home because there was only my mother and she was physically unable to cope. We didn't have any help from any local authorities. Nobody was able to give us any advice anyway, um, which was quite distressing for my mother. Um, put us through a lot of trauma. Um, so the only alternative was to ship me out of the wards of Stoke Mandeville, either to an old people's home or some other hostel. Yes, I think the situation that both Maggie and me were in, it's so typical. I mean, the, the onus for providing help, if you happen to need help, falls on the family, on, on your parents or your wife or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, we were both in this situation. I mean, for Maggie, her mother was too frail to give her the help that she needed. It was, of course, and Maggie's mother felt very guilty, quite certain that, you know, she couldn't provide that help. My uh, mother, you know, she, she was struggling on, and it was so typical again, you know. Time goes on, you're caring, uh, uh, relative gets older and older and less capable of coping and uh, breakdown is inevitable uh, you know it just can't go on forever and supported and that's the that was the uh, uh, the key to the whole thing I mean we just don't uh, socialize our helping arrangements enough they tend to be concentrated in families families feel guilty if they can't come up with the help and uh, when the help breaks down, people end up in institutions. Maggie and me were uh, just two of such, such, such typical cases. It's happening all the time. And one of the, uh, the strangest things of all is that when, uh, at the point where the help actually breaks down in one's own home, you know, when, you, when your elderly mother can't carry on coping anymore, instead of uh, replacing or supporting that situation actually in your own home in the community, what they do is just yank you out of it. 
The solution prescribed in most cases by the authorities for disabled people in this predicament is to accommodate them in a residential institution. This is described as the care or medical model for coping with physical disablement. We asked Ken and Maggie Davis and Pat and Norman Kelly to describe their experiences living under the care model. Nobody knew what to do with me. And so they eventually decided that um, because I, they tended to feel that I was an SRN and I was slightly more elite than the other Crips, that uh, you know I could go into the hostel. And it was explained to me that it was a very special um, place and that I was uh, rather honoured to be able to go into the hostel. And it was, in actual fact, the hostel was absolutely shocking. Um, it was one of the most dehumanising places I've ever been in. And apart from dehumanising the residents that were in there, I really felt that the people that were in charge were actually dehumanising themselves in the way that they maltreated people, not only physically, but also emotionally and mentally. And it was horrible. And it got so bad that I couldn't cope with it any longer. And I, I requested to be moved to a young chronic sick unit in Essex because it was near my home. Mm -hmm. And that was Pierce House, uh, which started off reasonably well because we had a very radical woman in charge but because she was so radical she was eventually manipulated out of the whole situation and we got some very very bad stuff and then it started deteriorating as per usual um, and then eventually I mean all this time Ken was visiting me and Cressy Fields cropped up which is a part three accommodation in, in Derbyshire and uh, we went to live there while this place was being built here. So it wasn't quite so bad me being with Ken because we had the mutual support then, but being on my own in an institution was, was pretty <coughs> terrible. Now, I'm not really quite sure how I managed to come through it, quite honestly. Well, mm. I've heard people in our local authority here, you know, refer to the local institution as being integrated into co part of the community. I've never heard of such idiocy in my life. It's crazy. Mm. But uh, no, the correct place for us is in that sort of situation where, of course, people like us can get the help we need uh, round the clock. Whether we need it or not, it's there and, of course, we should be grateful. And, of course, we're not because it's a gross imposition on one's own freedom and uh, it's a totally insensitive solution uh, to disabled people's problems. It causes disability rather than assists uh, one to overcome it. I've been there about 18 months. World uh, Bank is a local authority hospital. Yeah, yeah. I've been there about 18 months when no one came. And uh, well, we got friendly and, and we decided to get married. We were planning for a due wedding. But when the warden heard about it, he didn't want us to get married at all, so we decided to speed things up. Because we were going to move normally into an old people's hall. Anyway, we had that many meetings with the authorities and that many reasons that uh, we shouldn't get married pointing at us, that we got fed up of waiting because he was speeding things up about moving now into this old people's home. So one day I got into a taxi, told Norman that I was, what I was doing. Norman sat and waited on me and I went to the register office to arrange for things, you know, to start rolling. And the man from the register office phoned us up and said, when we go down to sign the papers. The warden said we couldn't go because he was crafty enough to listen to the call from the office, you see. And uh, so the man from the register office very kindly came to my room in which we signed all the necessary papers. And a fortnight later, we got we got in a taxi uh, to the register office and got married. 
No. While we were there, uh, Norma's niece beforehand had set a table in a room which was allotted to anybody. I mean, you were free to go in. It didn't matter whether one gave you permission or not. Uh, that uh, Mum and Norma's niece would bake cakes and set, you know, lettuce and things like a cold tea. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had any sort of reception whatsoever. When, when the day finally did come to an end, and it was time to go to bed, we were told that we would have to tolerate being in separate rooms for at least three weeks. This means that Norman went in the room he shared with a man and I went in the room he sh I shared with a woman. But it didn't go on for three weeks, it went on for seven months. And when I finally went to him and asked him, he said that uh, he thought if we played about long enough that we would get divorced and that uh, everything would be, you know, all right, run smooth again. So I said, no, I said, we're not doing that. If that's the way, I'll get out. So he says, well, he says, you know where the door is, do what you can. Because he thought, uh, we wouldn't do anything, you see. I think it's, there's an arrogant assumption on the part of the existing professional structure that it is perfectly right and proper for them to make decisions about our lives. And that doesn't matter whether it's, uh, you know, a district health administrator or... Um, you know, a regional medical officer or whatever, and making a decision about the siting of a young chronic sick unit in, in the grounds of this hospital or that hospital, uh, or whether it's something simple like the issue of incontinence pants. Uh, the essence uh, of the problem in both cases is that uh, they have the authority, they undoubtedly have been given the power uh, to make these decisions uh, for their patients, in inverted commas, their clients, and they think it's the right thing to do. Uh, the thought of participating with their clients, hearing them, uh, having, uh, uh, and just working out on an equal basis uh, the kind of requirements just has never really uh, occurred to anybody that uh, I, I had ever met, because the whole course of professional uh, help is given on the uh, 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 is delivered to you across this barrier of prescription. Uh, you're on the receiving end, they're on the giving end. You are the dependent person, they are the person in authority. Yes, can I just also add, add there the whole ethos of, of the caring profession is that they're caring for people that are sick and they just can't get it into their heads, and I don't know when they ever will, that disabled people are not sick, that they have a condition that has to be coped with. Um, and so you know, they, they just treat you all all along the board as as sick people and, and I think that that's really very, very wrong. But I don't know how I mean I think it's disabled people that have really got to to educate the, the professions but but they don't like you to do that. This again is where I think uh, for the first time in, in this country it's it's now more generally true across the uh, in, in different countries, that uh, you know the medical model uh, as a determinant of disability uh, is being discarded by disabled people themselves as being a particularly inappropriate way of describing what disability is. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, then, uh, Ken and Maggie, about the which you just really led into about the aims and origins of growth Thank you. The uh, yeah, I mean after Maggie I, and I had met and we decided that we wanted to spend our life together and live together, um, you know, we really didn't know at that stage how to go about it. I mean, what we knew was that we wished to avoid certain things that, uh, uh, that we'd experienced in, in institutions. We, we, we knew what we wanted to avoid in a sense. The, 
the concept lying at the back of Grove, Grove Road was a reaction. It was uh, a reaction against the kind of inhuman uh, conditions that uh, we'd uh, found in, in institutions. Uh, and we began to spell out what it was that we didn't want. You know, we, we didn't want it to, where we were going to live to stick out like a sore thumb. You know, like uh, you can tell, you know, your modern institution, you, like you could your Victorian one from 10 miles distant, mm -hmm. you know, through the wrong end of a tele telescope. You can tell it. <laughs> You know, somehow the architects are so good at uh, making places uh, stand out as being special. And we didn't want that. We wanted it not to have some fancy name uh, tagged on to it like they tend to, that, that uh, it's redolent of sweet-smelling meadows and streams <laughs> and hills on it, you know, which uh, is intended to gloss over the harsh reality of the lives of the people that live in these places. No, we didn't want that. We just wanted it to be 28 to 38 Grove Road. <laughs> Thought of, it, of us at the time. We were insisting that uh, we worked with them as equals. You know, and I mean, they, I guess it says a lot for people like Anthony Pearson, who was the architect of the place, that he was able to you know, I accept that because I mean, at that stage, in 1973, um, by and large, uh, you know, you you were deferential in your approach to to people who were professional and involved, and uh, we were insisting to that they, that is, the social services and the housing association and everybody, were actually participating with known potential tenant in the flats here. It was, it was a key thing, and that it wasn't something that they would dream up for us. It wasn't something that they would prescribe for us. It had to stop that. That was the key point. It had to come from us. It didn't matter whether it was wrong, mm -hmm. whether we made a mistake, mm -hmm. but, you know, you, once somebody prescribes it for you, you've lost your freedom to express out of your own experience the solution to your problems. You've lost that once people have prescribed it for you and uh, so it was important. And the idea was the sim this very simple one that, you know, that ought to be people who are able-bodied, who would be willing to live close to us and to be uh, willing to be called on to help us if we needed their help. And of course there was a lot to it really, there was more to, the, to it than just the practical help because when you're coming out of an institution as everybody knows, it's not just a matter of uh, setting up a system of help. You, it's, a, it's a system that has to incorporate in it a number of emotional supports as well and uh, you know that this was something else where out of our own experience we were de we were developing the ideas and discussing them with the people who were willing to help us the non-disabled potential tenants of the flats here uh, and ourselves were discussing the kind of support and encouragement that we might need as we were trying to face these um, issues of actually moving into an un what was an unknown situation to us um, and helping us over the artificial dependency that had been created in us uh, through, you know, the long experience of living in institutions. Because even though, as, as Maggie said earlier, um, you know, I, you know, she was in an institution, but I joined her in an institution in Derbyshire. Um, for some years myself, so I had direct experience of the same thing, not as long as Maggie, but enough to know something of the kind of pressures that you're under when you're in that sort of situation, and something of the fears that you feel when you're faced with the reality of moving out. And those, re those fears are pretty real, aren't they, Maggie? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> After so long in an institution, I, I was just uh, quite, uh, 
quite terrified of moving into a situation where, uh, well, I didn't have any confidence anyway because my confidence had all been robbed from me in the institutional setting. And uh, I, I just wondered how I would cope, although I knew that deep down I could, but I was still frightened. Um, and I think for the first six months that I was here, I, I was just totally exhausted because I, I was, you know, trying. I was being in much more independent than I'd ever been, you know, all that time in the hospital setting because they don't allow you to be independent anyway. And uh, so it was quite exhausting. But I, yeah, I did. I did find it emotionally. Um, pretty difficult as well. But after the sort of six months, I began to feel a lot better and was able to cope a lot more. So you'd actually dare to decide to leave the institution and come and live on your own, but you couldn't have started without some sort of care support already organized. How yes. did you set about this? Yes, that's right. In, uh, in actual fact, we'd already identified our helpers. Um, so it was quite, we'd had a, quite a few discussions before we actually moved in about how we were going to cope. Um, that I, I wouldn't be able to cope very well emotionally um, and how our helping families would be able to support me in that way as, as obviously as well as the physical side. I worked out how many hours of physical help I'd need which was grossly overestimated because I said 20, um, over 20 hours to maybe 30 hours. In actual fact, when we moved in, it was eight hours the first week, and that was mainly moving in, and then it gradually lessened. And I kept a regular log book for two years about this, and it, and it just slowly decreased and decreased until now it's about maybe an hour a day, which I would have thought impossible when I actually moved out because the institution, um, because of the dependency and interdependency in the institution, I, I just didn't know what I would be capable of. But emotionally, yes, I, I did need help, but mm -hmm. the families were always around to give me that emotional support. Uh, it's true also that we did not see the help as being simply one way, uh, as coming you know, in the direction of physically impaired people from uh, the people who are not uh, disabled. We saw it as being a cooperative process where the uh, physically impaired tenants uh, had uh, just as much uh, responsibility to cooperate with the non-disabled tenants uh, as between themselves in main maintaining a level of support. So we had to be conscious of each other's needs all the way around. That was the, the basic idea and that's how we, we worked it through in practice. Intech Housing Association. Uh, I find to go on a training scheme whereby the, if you pass the, you know, the, well, I'll say test because I forgot the word that was used, but if I pass the test, I can go in, into a flat on my own. Anyway, the specialist that organised it, uh, I've forgotten about it, but he came up and did examine me. And when he found out that we were married, he took both of us, you see. And we had seven weeks, no, six weeks planned at Mangan Lodge. Now, we had several good examinations, didn't we? Yeah. While we were in there. That's a, a younger disabled unit. Yes. Yeah. Apart from apart from the the, the you know the uh, tests that we went in for, we had examinations to see the mobility of our limbs and things, and you know uh, how we like you and that. So while we were being examined for these, I I kept. Uh, talking to the spe uh, specialist and I kept saying, well, I don't want to go back to Willowbank and I kept saying what was happening, you see, not thinking, I thought, well, I might as well tell him because he's not taking any notice because he never looked as if he was. Well, apparently he must have been because he came and said, uh, at the end of our training, he came and said, 
Well, I hope you go on all right and you don't have to go back there because I've done what I can, you see. So, uh, when we were emphatic about not going back to Willow Bank, he, he, the specialist that organised for us to go there uh, said we could have another three weeks extension there. But after these three weeks, the time really was up. Uh, and we had to make our own plans. Meantime, the social workers came in, didn't they? Yeah. And they said that there was no flats available anywhere that they could think of. And what they suggested was that Norman went home to his family and I went home to mine. Um, this we weren't prepared to do after fighting, coming this far, you know, we weren't, well, we weren't going to split up now, we just never know when you get back. So we said we wouldn't do that. And in the meantime, uh, some people came and asked us about being married and being disabled, and uh, we told them what was happening. And uh, they said that, uh, they learned of this having tax scheme in Yorkshire and would we come and have a look at it? Well, by this time, we were willing to have a look at any, anything. The housing officers from having tank said that we could have the flats, uh, you know, any time we were ready to move in because it had been up a long time. So we got, we made a note of the rent and necessary things and I got to, I got what was, uh, you know, the housing officer said in, in writing so that, well, you have to cover everything. I mean, you know, it's not good just by word of mouth saying what he said. So I got it put in writing and I took it back to the place. Uh, I don't think they were very happy about it, but anyway, they had to put up with it because the evidence was there. And uh, the physiotherapist there said that uh, by no means could we move into the flat without a host or help, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with several things like getting up or going to bed. Anyway, this we got with district nurses for a bit, didn't we? Yes. What's the, what's the, the, the biggest differences in quality of life, pattern normal well, between here and the residential? Hospital? The biggest difference is the amount of privacy is smashing. Mm. It really is. I mean, I mean, just to be able to get up and go to bed and, and you know, what time you want and have mm. your meals and instead of saying, come on, it's ready, if you don't come, yeah. it's moved off the table. Mm -hmm. Did you have any trial when you came to the VA? Uh, we had a trial period of three months. This means that the warden kept her eye on us, uh, and it depended on how many times we rang for the warden in these three months as to whether we could have the flat enough. But we didn't ring for the water, so mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were saying, well we don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. Yeah. no. Housing associations have been helpful in assisting to exist. We spoke to Ken Davis about the halfway house scheme. Uh, yes, there's a house nearby here which has been converted and is used for want of a better label as a rehabilitation flat which um, is intended for people who live in a local institution to um, move out into this flat, which is a kind of um, sheltered, if you like, ordinary uh, house in a local village uh, with plenty of support on hand, drawn from people in the village mainly, but also underpinned by statutory uh, sources of support. Um, uh, the people there uh, can move on into this sort of halfway stage, uh, gaining support from each other in the group because the, there's room for three. 
uh, physically impaired people to live in this particular uh, house uh, before they then move on into their own homes uh, elsewhere in the area of their choice, which has already been done uh, in the case of um, one of the first people to occupy the uh, bungalow at Newton uh, and will soon be followed on by uh, two of the other people who live there. This is the bungalow at Newton. Phil Atkins was one of the three original occupants. He has since secured a flat of his own in Alfreton, Derbyshire. We asked him to describe the value of the halfway house scheme. Well, I was living in Cressy Fields, which is a residential establishment, institution, if you like. And I moved from there to the Newton bungalow in April 1980 where I was with two other disabled people as part of a transitional training programme, as it was called, you know, to, to training to become independent with a view to eventually getting my own flat. It was quite a well-equipped bungalow with track horse and we had local people helping, you know, as regards to the personal care and the meals and things like that. And also, you know, there was opportunity for us to do things as well. You know, like coping with bills and things, which was something I'd never been used to. Yeah. You know, I'd always been protected from that with living in institutions. How did you feel when you first went there? Well, it was very strange, you know, after four years in the institution with yeah, everything be. being done, and suddenly, being given responsibilities for things that you never, yeah. ever had to do. But after a few weeks, you know, I got used to the idea and as time went on, the easier it became. So do you think, looking back, you couldn't have gone straight from the institution into your own home, like you are now? I don't think I would have. It would have been successful. No. So that because I would have had to go through what I went through at Newton mm. before, you know, when I came here. Another alternative to institutional living is offered by the Community Service Volunteer Support Scheme. June Maltzer has three community service volunteers to look after herself and her son Frankie. June, what, what level of commitment have you had from the <coughs> social services with the provision of CSV is on the one-to-one -one scheme. Um, <clears throat> well, CS, uh, social services, in fact, have to make a certain amount of commitment um, <clears throat> to CSV before volunteers are sent to me. For example, they have to pay um, roughly £2,000 a year uh, to CSV in order for the project to continue. Um, <clears throat> there haven't been any problems during, I take it, in, in them providing the £2,000 which you referred to? Up to now, no. Um, well, only so far as um, at the beginning they were a bit reticent, but uh, at the uh, mention of uh, the Ombudsman, um, they became quite willing to provide the service. That's strange, isn't it? Because if, if yourself and Frankie were taken into residential care, wouldn't, there, wouldn't that be a tremendous cost, far in excess of £2,000 a year? Um, much more so. But <coughs> um, social services, like any other uh, bureaucratic agency, I think feel that um, putting Frank and I into home is f a far easier solution than, um, than thinking imaginatively of other ways of keeping me in the community. Could I just ask you about <coughs> the, the training of, of the CSV volunteers in order that they, they, they can meet your requirements? It, I take it that that is your responsibility, is it, Chair? Um, yes, it is. Uh, I find, obviously, um, because I've been handicapped all my life, I have ways of being lifted. There's 
is easier for me, and um, I found easier ways for the volunteers to lift me. And therefore, when they first come to me, there is an initial training period um, whereby um, the volunteers have to get used to me and I have to get used to the volunteers. Could local authorities do more to help? Don Simpson is the Borough Housing Officer for Rochdale Council. And I'll say that firstly by making a point about scale. Um, <clears throat> Rochdale, for instance, has got about 22,000 houses in, in management. We invest in new building and in alterations and improvements to existing buildings, several million pounds each year. So it, it's a big operation. Um, against that, the needs of severely disabled people um, involve a relatively small number of individuals. So that it seems to me that there is a very great deal we can do and should do um, in this field without us being able to say that we're at all obstructed by um, problems of resources and, uh, and not having the money because it's bound to represent a very small proportion uh, of the totality uh, of what we do. Now it seems to me that the line we should be taking is that if somebody doesn't want to live in an institution and they want a home of their own, we ought to be saying, uh, right, if that's what you want, we will deliver. But what about the human assistance part of it, which is essential? You, you, you wouldn't have very much control over that, would you? Well, uh, certainly I would expect that end of the job to be um, organised and provided by the health or social services um, or, or authorities. Um, but if I've taken the decision as Borough Housing Officer that here's a housing application that I've had and I'm going to make this person an offer, I would not accept a situation where somebody being eligible for the offer, wasn't able to take it up because the um, ancillary personal care wasn't being provided. Now, in fact, we have a very good relationship here with our social services department and it wouldn't be a problem here. Um, but if there were any signs of it being a problem, I, I would take it as an ancillary obligation as a housing provider to see that something was done about that. Do you see any problem in, in demand, actually, from disabled people and themselves for, the, for housing? reaching you as a yes. housing officer? I, I think at the moment th th uh, this is. Um, if, if somebody is in an institution and, and, and has been for some time, uh, their ideas about what's a sensible question to address to their local housing department may be based upon the kind of thinking we engaged in five years, ten years or twenty years ago. In, in the sense that they may not realise that we've moved on. Um, <clears throat> and I think we have got a need to communicate um, our ability and willingness to respond to applications from severely disabled people. We, we've got to go out and make it publicly clear um, that, that, that there is a willingness and an ability to respond. Well, <clears throat> I think the first point to understand in this is, is, is that compared with the scale of the rest of our operations, the number of severely disabled people that we're talking about is a small number. This borough is by no means uh, a large one in housing terms. I have 22,000 um, houses in management. When you're talking about rehousing applications from severely disabled people, you're talking about, <clears throat> in those terms, very, very small numbers. So that there's no way as a housing department that we could say, oh, here is a problem which overfaces us or that we've got any justification for running away from. Because when we've done what needs to be done, it's going to make a very, very small impact on the total scale of, of, um, of all our operations. Now, from that viewpoint, I, I would say uh, that if somebody has made the personal decision that he doesn't want to, or she doesn't want to live in an institution, wants to come out and have a home of their own, I, I would say that a department like mine should accept an absolute obligation to see that an appropriate dwelling is provided. And we couldn't possibly claim not to have the resources uh, to be able to meet that. Do you see any problems in the demand for this accommodation actually reaching the, the housing department? Well, yes. Um, it seems to me that that is, is, is a key issue. It, it's one thing for me to sit here and have fine ideas about what we could and should do for people. Um, <clears throat> but you, we can't actually respond to a housing application before we receive it. Um, the application has got to be made and therefore there's a need to communicate uh, to the appropriate disabled people that you have got that commitment and willingness.
to respond once once the once the claim is made. Gordon Dittlemore, Social Services Mr. Department, Dittlemore, Rochdale what is Council. What are the party doing to encourage severely disabled people to come out of residential care? Well, in conjunction with the Rochdale Crossroads Care Attendance Scheme, the Council have obtained an urban aid grant of £10,000 to specifically to enable disabled people to be discharged from residential care um, into specially designed uh, Council property, uh, either specially designed or specially uh, built uh, and uh, adapted property. And we are at the moment endeavouring to identify those disabled people who could in fact benefit from this uh, project. Now, uh, in a, a local voluntary home, there are a number of uh, disabled people who are, don't, didn't originate uh, from Rochdale. But we feel that uh, although there may be financial problems, it is the right of every disabled person, if they so wish, uh, to, to how to be rehoused. Mm -hmm. Able people, like us all, have got a chance, to, uh, must have the chance to be able to, to try something and, if necessary, to fail and to go back again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of, of, of life. You, 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 take, you take risks and you take chances and things fail and some things succeed. Mm -hmm. There are many disabled people in institutional care who perhaps don't appreciate that that might be possible to live in the community. Um, uh, and, of course, it's actually getting at those people as well and, 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 and getting the information to them mm -hmm. uh, if, in fact, staff, uh, residential staff at times tend to protect them. Judith Gray, Community Health Physician. What's required um, is uh, the provision of ordinary domestic-scale housing, um, either by the housing department or by housing associations, um, and the, their uh, adaptation, where necessary, by housing departments or social services departments. But most importantly, the provision of a flexible, multidisciplinary um, support service, which would enable those um, people with physical disabilities to live as normal lives as possible in as normal accommodation as possible. I'm not convinced by anything I've seen or read that, that people with a variety of severe disabilities cannot, I'm not convinced that they uh, cannot manage in ordinary housing. In other words, I think they can manage if the right support is provided at the right level at the right time. And that support ought to be support that is um, geared to the needs of those individuals, not planned in batches. People should not have to move their dwelling if their need levels, if their need level of need actually increases. If the level of need increases, the level of support should increase to that person in that house. And that way, um, people with a variety of different dis disabilities could be looked after in the community, in ordinary housing, in a position where they can mix readily with able-bodied people, where they can have meaningful um, meetings, friendships, interactions every day of their lives with people who are able-bodied um, and where their existence is not one that is segregated and cut off from the rest of society in some, um, however beautiful, however clean, um, young disabled unit or, um, or hostel. And I think that most people want to live lives that have uh, a degree of independence um, and that have that, that have some variety and to live in in a house that is your own that has whether it's rented or not the fact is you want to be able to control what goes on there that's that's what, what most of us want and I don't think that people with physical disabilities are any different from any other of us in those kind of needs and and requirements we want to have some control over our own lives, 
We want to be able to decide what we're going to do and, uh, and have that dignity of risk taking particularly um, uh, that, that all of us accord to ourselves, but very few of us accord to, to people with, with physical disabilities. You, the way I'd like to see things move would be for all the people working with physically d disabled people, whether they're from health service or from social services or from housing or whatever, would be working together on smallish geographical patches um, in teams. Uh, and, uh, and essentially money could, as it were, float between various departments and authorities. Yeah. And I don't think that this is totally pie in the sky since the Sheffield Local Authority have just now uh, agreed um, a strategy for mental handicap again uh, in the forefront, um, whereby the health and social services essentially share their money, uh, pool their money for mental handicap and jointly manage and, uh, and coordinate the services for mentally handicapped people mm. as a whole. So I think that that is the way forward. Mm. There are two interesting schemes for independent living which need mention. The first is the Preston Scheme, which is being promoted by the North British Housing Association and Lancashire Council. David Halpin explains. There's 131 dwellings on Watling Street Road in Preston. The whole 131 are to be built to mobility standards, but six units, um, sorry, houses and flats become units when you don't care. Six of them are, are to be built to wheelchair standard uh, for very severely dis physically disabled people. And it's to be supported on a 24-hour basis by community service volunteers, district nurses and home helps. That's the outline of the scheme. So really we want six, uh, six people in, in six units. Primarily, the first push is to, is to go around establishments where we have people living in residential homes and say, look, would you want to move out uh, from where you are? Now, of course, we pay for people from Cornwall to Johnny Groves, really. The second scheme is the Derbyshire Coalition of Disabled People. Brian Lewis, its vice chairman, elaborates. Uh, the whole emphasis is on choice, to give the maximum choice to the disabled person to live where and how he wants, um, with help, provided with helpers. Now, this, uh, how we would go about achieving this is twofold. First of all, the Centre for Independent Living would be, as I say, established in the centre of the county. And that really would act as a repository of um, information services. It would have a library of video programmes on all aspects of disability, housing, employment, transport, um, and all the other uh, care attendants register which would be updated daily and people who need uh, help us uh, who need their help that would also be part of the register alongside that would be um, and part of the building would be two bungalows and the whole purpose of the bungalows they would act as a halfway house between the initial uh, disability happening to a family and the whole family would move into one of these bungalows. Mm. As well as that, as well as having a, a purpose-built bungalow, they would also have at their disposal other services like peer counselling and model counsellors in order to help the disabled family. The whole thing will be a continuous process of learning and adapting as time goes on. But what it does mean is that the emphasis is of and responsibility of taking care of the disabled is thrown back into the community's lap where it belongs and hopefully where once they're given the assistance to be independent, the disabled person can contribute 
to society just as much as his able-bodied brother. Mm. And that is the whole purpose behind the DCDP's project. Well, where do we go from here? What is the way forward? Are physically disabled people making unreasonable demands on the statutory and voluntary authorities? Are they being ungrateful, selfish, or is it that the authorities are not capable of thinking imaginatively and assisting them to live within the community when all that is needed is purpose-built housing with the necessary aids plus flexible human support? Passing the, passing on the inside. Well, I feel that um, all the struggles I have had up to date I uh, have been um, through the ignorance uh, and insularity of, of professional agencies. Um, obviously, uh, years ago, uh, disabled people were not thought of as being capable of living within the community. Fortunately, today, uh, there are schemes such as CSV um, which enables disabled people to live within the community and uh, professional people have got to accept uh, that no longer are they in a totally caring situation all the time. Uh, and um, therefore I hope that uh, more people will in fact take up these opportunities to get out of institutions <clears throat> and live within the community. The most heartening thing that's happened in recent years, in my opinion, is that disabled people have uh, redefined disability in terms of their own experience and not slavishly adhered to the kind of definitions that uh, health professionals and others have uh, um, dreamed up and adopted for them on their behalf and which uh, of course many uh, people who are themselves disabled also accept as being a proper description of their condition. Mm. Um, it's a problem now for disabled people um, and the, the future for people in the professions I think is really very rosy. Once we've got to, to grips with this particular problem then you know professional people will be able to take a really a much more fruitful and uh, fulfilling role for themselves uh, as a result of this uh, struggle which we're going through in this particular phase. We're struggling out of one historical phase, the, de the, de the dependent, segregated phase of physically impaired people's existence into uh, this phase of uh, uh, self-defined, um, independent living. I think that the existing professional structure is, is uh, inappropriate to disabled people once they have um, moved out of that area of uh, uh, the acute phase of their condition the, or the area of sickness that appears to be proper to medicine. Uh, it's up to disabled people to develop their own services now. It's up to them to develop them out of their own experience, to define their condition and to uh, come up with the solutions out of their own experience. And the proper role for the existing professionals, as they find themselves under attack at the moment, is to support that process, because it's certainly never going to be the case that they're ever going to be redundant. Indeed, they may find themselves in a far better position of having a, a much better professional role to play in terms of uh, being certain that they are supporting a person's independence, helping that person to get into, um, you know, normal uh, social situations which embrace the whole sphere of human life, not just uh, uh, stopping at living in a flat like this, but uh, to do with the, uh, the environment generally within which, um, you know, accessible and usable flats are placed to do with issues like employment and education and everything else. Now, so the support of professionals into non-integrated situations, uh, I'm sure, could be very helpful. But the, it is only support. It's up to disabled people to design their own services to make these things happen.